In the last session, we looked at five stories which involved increasing controversy between Jesus and the Jewish authorities, which escala escalated to a climactic decision on the part of the Jewish authorities to destroy Jesus. In this session, we want to look at several texts that show the increasing dichotomy between the positive reaction of the common people in the crowds who follow Jesus and the negative developing reaction developing among the members of official Judaism. Up to this point, we have looked at every unit in a particular section. From this point on, we have to pick and choose our texts in order to get through the entire gospel in 16 sessions. From the material already presented, you should be able to study and pray over these texts that we gloss over with fruitful results. There are three major sections that we look, wish to look at in this session. They occur in chapters 3 and 4 of the Gospel text. After a second short summary statement, Mark 3, 7 to 12, we have the first of these sections entitled The Commissioning of the Twelve. That text is followed immediately by a narrative of opposition from the relatives of Jesus and from the scribes. Finally, we look at the literary form of parable and will illustrate that literary form with an analysis of three of Jesus' parables, the sower, the seed growing by itself, and the mustard seed. After a short summary of what Jesus has been doing in the region of Galilee, the text turns to the narrative of the commissioning of the Twelve. The group that has come to be known as the Twelve constitute the inner core of Jesus' followers who have been chosen. The text tells us that Jesus ascends a mountain, and from the many who have joined him and those who have been specifically called, he summons those whom he wants, and they come to him. A special group is being constituted within the larger number of followers with a special purpose. That group will, become, will come to be known as the Twelve, who also receive the name Apostle. So it could be said that from the many who have been following Jesus, hearing and putting into practice his teaching, his disciples, he singles out twelve whom he will send out with a mission, apostles. Mark gives us a double purpose for this commission. First, they are to be with him. And second, they are to be sent forth for another double mission, preaching, and having power over demons. In other words, they are being sent forth to do what Jesus has been doing. Jesus' ministry is now expanding to where he enlists the aids of followers to be a part of that mission. This commission is a very significant message for our own lives as followers of Jesus sent to spread the faith through the sacrament of confirmation. Just as with those early ministers, missioners, it is necessary that we have a relationship with Jesus, spend time and be with Jesus through prayer, biblical meditation, etc. And just as important, we must take the fruit of that being with Jesus and go out and spread the good news. We too have a part to play in the mission of Jesus. Mark then goes on to name the twelve. In the New Testament, there are four lists of the names of the twelve. One in Matthew, one in Mark, two in Luke, one in the Gospel, and one in Acts. We note that the first four listed are Peter, Andrew, James, and John in all four lists. These are the four whose call was narrated in chapter 1. The names are in a different order in each list except that Peter is always first due to his position of primacy among the twelve. The second four, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas, are the same in all four groups, except that the order is again different. It is only when we reach the final four that a significant difference occurs. All four lists agree on James, the son of Alphaeus and presuming that Simon the Canaanian and Simon the Zealot are the same person, again there is agreement. Matthew and Mark speak of Thaddeus, while Luke 
in the Gospel and Acts lists Judas of James. Curiously, the fathers of the church have joined these two to produce Jude Thaddeus. Finally, all four lists give Judas Iscariot as the last member of the Twelve. In the minds of many, placing Judas last is the result of his actions later on in the Gospel, particularly in the Passion narrative. This commissioning ends with a simple statement that afterward he went home, presumably back to Capernaum. Despite the opposition of official Judaism, the crowds still flocked to Jesus. Now Mark tells us that these crowds were so great that Jesus and his co-workers are not even able to eat. This leads to further objections to Jesus' ministry from the scribes and from a group closer to home, his relatives. This unit on opposition is, is organized around the familiar literary device of Mark and Sandwich, this time a Markan double-decker sandwich. The outside concerns opposition from, to Jesus' ministry from his family. Next, opposition and the charge of collusion with Satan from the scribes, and the inside is an illustrative story about the binding of a strong man. The popularity of Jesus leads the relatives to set out to seize him, holding that he is out of his mind. He is beside himself. There is a certain amount of unwillingness to believe on the part of the relatives. But the scribes who have been opposing him kick their opposition up a notch, saying that he is in co a collusion with the devil, Beelzebul. It is by the power of the prince of demons that he casts out demons, that the abilities that he possesses operate. Both of these evaluations of Jesus' mission stand in contrast to the evaluation of the crowd. Jesus then meets these head-on, beginning with the scribal charge of collusion with the devil. He summons the scribes and speaks to them using illustrations. We'll look more in depth at the notion of parable or illustration later in this session. How can Satan drive out Satan, he asks. If they're right, and he is in collusion with Beelzebul or Satan, then wouldn't Satan be working against himself when Jesus casts out a demon? In other words, Satan's kingdom or house would be divided, and a divided kingdom or house will not be able to stand. Abraham Lincoln certainly realized this when he cited this text to speak of the ultimate destiny of our country if the Civil War continued. In a yet more emphatic formulation of the argument, Jesus says, if Satan rises against himself and is divided, it is not possible for him to stand, but he has an end. Now the power of Satan is still at work in the world, and so Satan has not had an end and thus the charge must be false. Jesus is not working in collusion with Satan. He is rather an agent of God sent to curtail the activity of Satan. One of the ways that he does this is through the expulsion of demons. As we approach the center of the sandwich, the image shifts from internal division to external attack. No one enters the house of a strong man to rob and vandalize his property, unless the strong man has been tied up. Then the plunder of the house can begin. This seems a bit strange, but in using this illustration, Mark is telling us that the world has come under the influence and power of Satan, and it needs to be brought back under the influence and power of God. That's yet another meaning of the inbreaking and the nearness of the kingdom of God that we saw in chapter 1. So Jesus is the one who will plunder the house of Satan, the strong man. But in order to do so, he must first tie up or bind the strong man, Satan. So Jesus' healings and exorcisms are means of binding or tying up 
or curtailing Satan's action in the world. This poses a few points for reflection. Do you ever think of Satan's action in the world? Do you realize that the good that you do might be curtailing the power of Satan in the world? With the illustrations showing that Jesus is the agent of God, he returns to the rebuttal again against the scribes. Those who have said that Jesus is truly possessed are misunderstanding his mission, and in fact they're acting to curtail and put an end to that mission. They can be said to be working against the inbreaking of the kingdom. Jesus now solemnly proclaims using the formula, Amen, Amen, I say to you, that such is opposed to the plan of God and is an act directed against God and God's beloved benevolent actions on behalf of his people. Jesus notes that all sins and blasphemies that people will utter will be forgiven. Why does Mark separate sins and blasphemies? Blasphemy, as we have seen, is the charge that the scribes brought against Jesus in the controversy over forgiveness of sins in chapter 2. It is the specific sin of taking to oneself what belongs to God. It is precisely this charge of blasphemy that Jesus counters here in this very difficult text. Jesus qualifies his previous statement, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an everlasting sin. Now interpreters for centuries have tried to determine what this unforgivable sin is. It's really rather simple. The scribes have said that Jesus acts in the power of Satan when he actually acts in the power of God. They are thus ascribing the power of God to Satan, which is ultimately an insult to God. They're trying to put a stop to the plan of God. They're trying to destroy Jesus. Now, that's unforgivable, don't you think? If you think that I'm exaggerating, look at Mark's next line, giving the reason for speaking of an unforgivable sin. They had said, he has an unclean spirit. Returning to the family and their assessment of his ministry, Jesus basically divorces himself from those who call themselves his family. His mother and his brothers arrive where Jesus is, and from the outside they sent word calling for him. Notice that the blood family is outside while the true family is inside. The blood family does not understand him nor his mission. Those inside tell him that his mother and his brothers are seeking him. This leads to a rather startling redefinition of the family. Jesus' true fa family are those who do the will of God, acceptance of God's will, acceptance of the kingdom's inbreaking into one's life makes one a family member of Jesus. As we move to chapter 4, we have the first discourse of the Gospel of Mark, in which he teaches by means of parables. Now the parable is Jesus' favorite teaching method because it draws on the experience of the people to illustrate how the kingdom of God is active and can be active in their lives. By now you would figure that I might toss out a few Greek words, and you would be right. The English word parable comes from components connected to two Greek words, para meaning beside, and bole from the verb balo meaning to throw. Hence, a parable is a placing of two things beside one another for the sake of comparison. 
It is using one thing to explain another. From literary study, we know that comparisons can be explicit using a comparative word such as like or as, in which case the comparison is called a simile. For example, what I am doing is sending you out like sheep among wolves in Matthew 10.16. The comparison may also be implicit without the use of a comparison word, in which case it is known as a metaphor. For example, you are the light of the world in Matthew 5.14. From the definition, we can surmise that there are three components to a parable. The unknown the known experience used to explain it, and the point or meaning of comparison. So much of the study of parables was done by Germans in the late 19th and early 20th century that the names of these parts are usually given in German. First, there is the unknown, the point of the kingdom of God or its inbreaking in our lives that Jesus wants to illustrate. It's known as Die Sache or the thing or the matter to be explained. Secondly, there is the known, the experience or point taken from daily lives of the hearers to illustrate the unknown. <coughs> it is known as das Bild, <coughs> or the picture which illustrates. And finally, there is the point of comparison, which is the point of communality between the unknown and the picture or the known. This is the point where the light bulb goes on in your head and the unknown becomes clear. In your experience, when a teacher or a priest in a homily uses an illustration from a well-known novel or movie or poem to bring to life a point that he or she is making, he's using the parable form. Perhaps the most well-known of the parables that appears in all three of the Gospels is the parable of the sower. The illustration is drawn from the area of farming, which was a very common occupation among those who followed Jesus. That worked well for Jesus, but illustrations from farming for a 21st century city audience does not work quite as well. It's necessary to understand the farming methods used to understand what Jesus is saying. In Jesus' day, a farmer would sling a bag of seed over his shoulder and go out to the field and take a handful of seed and throw it, where, and wherever it landed, it landed. Hence the seed could fall on pathways, rocky ground, among thorns, or of course on good ground. Now that's not good seeding practice in our day but it was in the first century. So with that background in mind, we have five parts in this parable. An initial scene describing the farmer going out to sow. This is followed by a narrative of three places the seed fell that did not produce fruit. The path, the rocks, and the thorns. The parable concludes with a scene speaking of the seed that produces. The initial scene begins with a summons to listen or hear what is being said. That forms a bookend with the final exhortation at the end of the parable to hear, both using the Greek word akuo, meaning to hear. Once the audience is hearing, they are then to see or behold. I would surmise that Jesus is inviting them to picture in their mind's eye a sower who goes out to sow. Note, it's the sower who gets the story in motion, but the main thrust of the parable is the seed. So the parable of the sower is really misnamed. It should be the parable of the seeds, because it is the seeds that take center stage in the parable. Now one of the interpretations leads to Jesus being the sower, 
and his ministry of teaching is the act of sowing. Such a line of thinking has been enshrined in a popular liturgical hymn based on this parable, entitled, Sow the Word. The fate of the seeds is varied. Some of the seed fell on the footpath, literally beside the footpath. Notice the para. And what happened to it? It is left open to the possibility of being trampled on by passers-by, or birds will swoop down on the path and eat, or as the Greek implies, devour the seed. Hence it does not have a chance of taking root and growing. Now to carry the discussion of first century Palestinian farming practice further, the Mishnah gives the order of growing grain as follows. So, plow, reap, bind, thresh, and winnow. Thus, contra to our accepted practices, sowing precedes plowing. Most 21st century farmers would do just the opposite. Other seeds fell as they were strewn on the rocky ground. This is ground with either no soil covering it or a very thin layer of soil covering hard rock. The seed is able to germinate and begins to grow, but because of the rock it's unable to put down roots and thrive. Note the typical Markan word immediately. When the soil, when the sun hits it, it has no roots and is therefore scorched. The word used for wither literally means to dry up. Yet other seed ended up in thorns. It has soil to put down roots, but when it does, thorns also grow, and they choke the life out of the growing grain. Thus there is no yield of seed from this seed either. The prospects of a good harvest are getting bleaker and bleaker. However, there, is, there are yet other seeds that fall on good ground. Not a path, no rock, no thorns. These are able to put down roots and be enriched by the nutrients of the soil and the warmth of the sun. And that seed, they, and those seeds produce fruit. Note, the tense of the Greek verb implies that this is not a one-time event. It is continuous it was bringing forth fruit. In fact, Mark tells us that those seeds produced 30, 60, and a hundredfold. The questions asked, is this yield exceptional? Ancient writers seem to imply that such a yield is normal, an average to a good harvest. The parable ends with an exhortation. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. This implies that not everyone will be able to hear what Jesus is saying. The use of the verb hear in this statement forms the inclusion with the command to hear that we saw at the beginning of the parable. Now, what has this parable told us about the kingdom? In verses 13 to 20, an explanation is given that can be summarized as follows. When the kingdom is brought to us by means of the word of God, that word is sown by prayer through God or Jesus, through priests, parents, spouses, friends, etc., who in one way or another minister to us. Now some don't have a chance to grasp the word before it's taken from them parallel to the footpath. Others grasp the word, but their faith has very little root or strength, and when difficulties, mocking, questioning occurs, they fall away. That would be like the seed on the rocky ground. Others have some root, but the things of the world, status, power, riches, possessions, get in the way of the growing faith, and it's choked. 
similar to the seed among thorns. Finally, there are those who hear the word, and it sinks roots, and they grow in the love of the word, deepen their faith. This would be the good soil. This explanation looks at the parable from the point of view of the various types of soil. Yet the parable implies that the kingdom is likened to a sower who sows his seed. What if we concentrate on the process rather than on the soil? The sowing of the seed is the kingdom. It comes to many different types of people who have different responses, the different types of ground. Some are negative and they kill the seed. Others are positive for a while. And then there are those who grasp the message of the kingdom, let it sink its roots deep in them, and become great examples and promoters of the faith. The key is that all of these are part of the kingdom. When a priest enters the pulpit to preach his homily on Sunday, and all the people in the congregation hear or don't hear what he says because of their particular situation or circumstances, etc., and he does not know how the Lord is using his words to affect that congregation, he may come to the end of the homily and feel, oh my, I think I really missed it. But at the end of Mass, a few people tell him how much his words helped them, while everybody else files by giving a quick morning, Father, and then leave. Perhaps five or ten years later, someone will come up and say, Do you remember that homily on such and such that you preached? It turned my life around. Our efforts to sow the seed do not bear 100% results. We cannot be discouraged over that. Jesus knew that. The apostles in the early church knew that. And we need to take solace that in the 21st century, it's all part of the expansion of the kingdom. A number of sayings follow the interpretation of the parable of the sower. These highlight the importance of using the gifts and the light that God has given to us. They usher in two more parables from the area of farming. The first of these is the parable of the seed growing secretly, which, by the way, only occurs in Mark. This takes the same picture as the parable of the sower, but chooses to illustrate a different point about the kingdom of God. Structurally, the two parables that follow are similar. Both begin with the introductory phrase, and he was saying. This is followed by a reference to the kingdom of God, and then an illustration involving the seed. Finally, a conclusion with an allusion to the phrase, on the ground. The first parable, known as the parable of the seed growing secretly, begins with the picture, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed upon the earth. Note the phrase, scatter seed upon the earth, is a graphic illustration of the farming procedure which we described above. But then the picture seems to forego any further mention of the farming methods, rather it concentrates on the actions of the sower or the farmer after he's planted the seeds. He will sleep and rise night and day, and meanwhile the seed goes its merry way, germinating and eventually sprouting into a plant. How, the farmer does not know. The Greek text has a wonderful word to describe the process, automate, from which we get the word automatic. The key point is that the seed interacts with the earth and the elements without any assistance from the sower and the farmer. At the proper moment, the earth bears fruit, the blade, the ear, and then the full grain in the ear. At the end of the process, when the grain is ripe, the farmer, the sower, acts again, putting in the sickle to harvest his crop. 
The point that is being made is that when we sow seeds, that is, when we preach the word verbally or non-verbally, we have no control over how that word will be accepted. All we can do is speak, preach, or teach the word. The parable emphasizes the unpredictability of God. We do our part, but we cannot control the outcome. That's totally in the hands of God, and we have to accept that. The second of the two parables here takes as its picture the mustard seed, which is said to be the smallest of seeds in existence. A man takes this seed and sows it on his property. That same seed, when it has reached maturity, becomes the largest of plants, with large branches for the birds to dwell in its shade. The point of the parable is fairly clear. Great things come from small or humble beginnings. If we just look at the Gospel of Mark, we realize that the Jesus movement, which we have been tracing as it grows and expands, began with just Jesus and four Galilean fishermen. The small group of 120 from the upper room at Pentecost formed the beginning of the Christian movement which numbers in the billions in just the Catholic Church today. The reason for this phenomenal growth is the action of God. And this parable, as the last one, taught us that we must trust in the action of God as we carry out his mission as his followers. Mark concludes the parable's discourse with a simple declaration. With many such parables, he was accustomed to speak the word to them. The verb tense was accustomed, the, inter the imp imperfect, implies that this is not a one-time speaking, but rather a speaking which occurred over and over again in Jesus' ministry. Many have seen the word as a summary of Jesus' teaching. Mark continues to note that this was according as the hearers were able to listen. Jesus' preaching was tailored to the listener and usually involved the use of illustrations drawn from everyday life known as parables. However, those who were supposed to be more in the know, the disciples, Jesus took aside and interpreted everything for them. As we shall see, even with that private personal interpretation, they still, throughout the gospel, fail to get the message. The parables show us that the kingdom embraces all sorts. It will, through its own inevitable process, grow into greatness. And nevertheless, we must not forget that we have a part in that growth. <laughs>